I know the title said best, I really just mean the ones that are very commonly played, and ones you should look out for in building new characters a new player. Because this is a guide focused at new players. And if I miss anything, let me know in the comment section down below. But with that, let's get started by discussing what an archetype exactly is. I think the best way to describe what an archetype is, is just go over one. So, let's for instance go over champion archetype. So, every archetype feat, or every archetype, has a starter feat called a dedication, and it will be marked by this dedication trait. And you need to take this dedication feat, and that gives you access to everything else in the archetype. You can think of archetypes as many feat trees you can decide to go into. And for champion here, it says that it gives you a cause as if you were a champion, you gain proficiency in armor, you get trained in a couple skills. And that's really what it does. So, dedication feats usually are just, here's your basic ability to now say you are part of this archetype, here's your cool thing to start with. And going on, it then has feats at higher levels that you need to have the dedication feat to take, and then you can take any of these feats as you level up. At the proper level, usually replacing the class feat. So, if you are not using for archetype and you wanted to go into champion archetype, you need to give up your level 2 class feat in order to take champion dedication instead. So if you're something like a sorcerer that wanted to be a champion dedication, you would probably need to give up something like the expanded cantrips or any of those types of feats, then take this. The difference is with free archetype, you don't need to make that choice as you're going to have an extra feat slot that can only be used for archetype feats. In this case, things like champion are very good in that because just having armor is really nice. So, with that, let's now move to all of the archetypes that can give you armor proficiencies. And of those, we have the champion that I mentioned earlier, which, at that level 2, immediately gives you light, medium, and heavy armor training. You do need to have both strength and charisma to get into it, though. So that is a downside, because not every character can invest charisma 14 at the time they want to take this level 2. So that can be rough, particularly if you're a wizard or something along those lines that really can't afford to be putting points into, into strength and charisma. So that is a legitimate downside. And the other major downside of this one is that you only get expert and only when you take another feat at level 14. So that's very late. Casters normally get their armor boost proficiency at level 13. So you're gonna be a level behind all the other casters at getting your expert armor and you're going to be a few levels behind the marshals, even the ones that get slowly like rogues and barbarians. But champion dedication also gives a lot of other stuff beyond the armor. For example, champion feats, which, meh. A little bit more HP if you're a lower HP class, and if you're taking champion archetype, you probably are a lower HP class, or you're going into it for the champion reaction, which I'll get to later. Healing Touch, Lay on Hands, so if you have somebody that's already doing a bunch of Treat Wound stuff, well, Lay on Hands can go along with that and continue helping the heal. Cool. More Champion Feats. Champion Reaction, so you can get something like Retributive Strike from Paladin, which is one of their major class features. And I'm going to put that up on screen. Alright, there it is. And it just says that you give an ally resistance and then you strike at that enemy, and has no multi-attack penalty because it's not on your turn. Very, very good. It's at level 6 here. Make it make sense, you know. Uh, Divine Ally. Usually this is going to translate to give a weapon of choice Ghost Touch, and it doesn't consume a rune slot, which is very good. So, very potent abilities in here. But its armor proficiency scaling is a little bit worse than something like Sentinel, which immediately from the dedication feat, has a clause that has it when a class feature grants you expert or greater, you also gain that proficiency in the armor types granted to you by this feat. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty great. Because that means suddenly Sentinel is automatically progressing those heavy armor types. Mind you, if you don't already have medium armor training, this is only going to get you up to medium armor. But 
still very good. And a thing to note about Sentinel is that if you are playing a free archetype game, it doesn't have a level 4 class feat because it has a skill feat instead. So you're going to end up having a blank slot in your free archetype. So a little bit of a feels bad there. As is a skill feat, you can still take it and then get out of the archetype easily enough. Whoop, going to get out of that. Anyway. And a lot of the stuff here just makes you better in heavy armor. Easy enough. So, then we also have Stalwart Defender. This is very much Dwarven flavored. It is uncommon, so that means you need to ask your GM before you can use it. Access of your Dwarf or of Undergone Defender trading in Dwarven Settlement. Easy enough. Its dedication feat gives you a stance that requires you to be wearing armor. And its effect gives you a bonus against shove and trip. You do not get to ignore any speed penalties from your armor due to having strength. And it gives you some temp HP. And that's the gist of it. This one here lets you become trained in medium and heavy armor. And then we can get expert grip proficiency in any armor. You also gain that proficiency rank in the armor types granted to you by the feat, which is very nice. And then a lot of its other stuff are just very, very useful things if you want to be generally bulky and tank. That's all I really have to say on it. I might make another video on this archetype specifically later, but if I go into detail on all these, we're going to be here for several, several hours. But on the topic of ways to make yourself bulkier, Beastmaster deserves a special shoutout. Because what it does is it gives you an animal companion, and it lets you progress this animal companion at the very fast rate that druids get to, for some reason, as a multi-class archetype. So you basically come as good as a druid at animal companioning. That's absurd. And you can see here are a list of all the animal companions. Just massive list of them. You can look through them. My favorites personally are the bird and the bear. Because bear has very high damage with d8 and d6 piercing and support benefit increases your damage for your marshal. Us like birds because dazzle is very fun to apply to enemies to make them waste even more actions. And I have a theme with the things I like to take. Due to that, Beastmaster, very, very strong, just because having an Elm Companion is very, very strong. Particularly if you're struggling with finding something to do with your third action, Command an Animal Companion is a great third action activity. And the Animal Companion, because it is just another body, it can help melee characters flank if you need to do that. It can also help with absorbing a couple extra hits in a fight. So, Animal Companions are generally very useful. And this just lets any character have Animal Companions at the cost of some feats. Which, very good. And something worth noting. Now here I have two dedications that are really, really important if you're going to be a shield using character. And your shield user character isn't a fighter. So, this is the Bastion dedication. Its main benefit is that it gives the Reactive Shield fire feat right when you take it. And what Reactive Shield does is it says... When you would be hit, you can just go ahead and raise a shield. That's pretty good. Because this lets you do all of the things that you want to do with your three actions, and then still have the ability to suddenly throw up your shield. Very, very nice. So, as such, it gives a lot of other things to make shield blocking better, and a lot of other fun things for shield blocking, like Nimble Shield Hand, blah, blah, blah. And eventually it turns into stuff like quick shield block, getting extra reactions, all very, very nice stuff. Last Wall Sentry is a bit more focused on beating down undead, but still gives reactive shield. And now it's talking about beating up undead, avoiding undead, getting ghost touch to beat up on undead. So this is more for something if you want to be an anti-undead type character that uses a shield, very strong. I just want to mention them both because they both have this thing of getting reactive shield very early on. And reactive shield is a very strong fighter feat. However, while we're on the topic of archetypes that give very strong fighter feats, let's talk about Dual Weapon Warrior, which gives us the feat Double Slice. And for those of you that do not know, Double Slice is like the premier dual wielding fighter feat. So, what it says is requirement you're wielding two melee weapons each in different hand. You make two strikes against the same target, one with each of your two melee weapons. If the second one doesn't have agile, it takes a minus two penalty. But you know what? Minus two? Lots more than minus five. 
So it's basically like a plus three on type bonus to that second strike, even if it isn't agile. And now, another fun thing is, shield boss is a weapon. Just saying. So if you wanted to do something like, let's say, a sword and shield barbarian, you can now use double slice, get that rage damage applying twice. Very, very strong. So it then talks about how it uh, interacts with resistances and other type stuff. So double slice, very fun. Then dual weapon warrior, basically just gives more stuff that's useful if you're a dual wielding character. If you want to build a dual wielding character, but your class doesn't normally support it, if you take Dual Weapon Warrior, you will not be disappointed. And you can take that right away at level 2. Very strong. Highly recommend. And on the topic of archetypes that can help improve your damage, let's go talk about Sniping Duo. So, this is a long text here, but basically it says you pick one of your friends and your party members, one of your party members to be your spotter. And when you shoot a thing and they hit the thing, you're both giving bonuses to each other to damage based on the amount of weapon damage dice you're dealing. So if you have striking runes, you'll be each dealing two extra damage to these guys. And you do not give each other uh, cover, like enemies cover when you're shooting past your spotter, because also a thing that's helpful if you're in a tight dungeon area. And then gives a lot of fun ranged weapon support feats, and there's a good way to put utility on a ranged character, when ranged characters can sometimes really struggle to get utility on them. Well, unless you look at some other archetypes. Now we're going to be moving to archetypes that are about skills. And the reason I'm recommending Medic Dedication also for ranged characters is because it really makes Battle Medicine better. And Battle Medicine is a single action activity that is a skill feat to gain access to and effectively, effectively, lets you do the Treat Wound style healing in combat a limited number of times per person, per day. However, with Medic Dedication, once per day, you can ignore that restriction. And if you're a master, it's once per hour. Very, very strong. And then also, with Doctor's Visitation, let's become a flourish to stride and battle medicine somebody. That is why you take Medic Dedication. It's these two feats right here. The other stuff just exists. That way you can take a feat to get out of Medic Dedication. A tree condition, that can even be a skill feat to get out of the Dedication. Very, very strong. A lot of power put in here that's in the form of healing your allies make sure everybody's still alive and if you're for example a bow user long bows and stuff are one plus hands not two hands so that means you don't need to take a hand off put an act to put the hand back on you're just assumed to have an open off hand and you can only shoot as long as that off hand is open because battle medicine lets you take out and put away the tools as part of the one action for some reason your off hand is always open so medic very good uh, and here I have a bunch of other archetypes that help bo boost different skills. Dandy is fun because it can boost two skills with just the dedication feat, being Society and Deception. It can boost them up to Expert right at level 2, so if you're a rogue you can have three skills at Expert right there, right at level 2. And that gives you a lot of very fun skill feats, like Distracting Flattery, and then some other even like newer things, because from Firebrands, a lot of stuff got added to the Danny Feet, like Tut Tut here. And a lot of these are just very fun, minorly silly type, I'm a high charisma character, I'm now going to feel myself type feats. And well, on a more sweaty note, we have the Acrobat. And what Acrobat does is immediately, it has your Acrobatics automatically progress to Legendary without you needing to put any more skills in ranks into it. It just has your acrobatics go from trained to legendary at the first opportunity the game would let you normally. And it doesn't count against your amount of skill increases you get. So this would let a normal character get fourth skills legendary instead of just three. So a lot of its feats are about tumbling through. However, as you start getting the higher level stuff, you can think like Graceful Leaper which starts letting you use acrobatics instead of athletics to do things like long jumping. And there are other things in here that are also really useful. And acrobatics is a generally nice skill to have as you start getting the upper levels because balance checks become more common. Maneuver and flight becomes more common. A lot of very common acrobatics actions do exist at the high levels. Now, I do want to mention Marshall. 
Marshall is another one that can give you a bonus to damage if you are doing the Intimidation type stance, and it lets you boost one of the Diplomacy or Intimidation up to Expert immediately, and it gives you other fun ways to fill actions. Very powerful archetype, gonna mention that in here. And then Investigator and Rogue, I'm gonna lump together because both these are multi-class archetypes that have a fun little thing at level 8 called Skill Mastery, which lets you bring a skill from Expert to Master, and a skill from trained to expert, and then you gain a skill feat associated with one of them. And if you're doing free archetype, you can just keep on taking this five times and get a bunch of things at master and then become a skill monkey very, very easily. And also, I should mention that uh, Rogue also lets you get to master reflex saves from a level 12 feat. Investigator lets you get up to master perception from a similar level 12 feet. Has skill mastery over here. And you also gain access to the Rogue Investigator, well, feats, which are also pretty nice for utilizing skills. So with that, that skill archetype's out of the way, let's move on to another multi-class archetype. And that is the Monk Archetype. Now the Monk Archetype does have a pretty rough prerequisite of Strength 14, Dex 14. And if you don't want to deal with that and you just want to use one of the stances, Martial Artist may be more where you want to go. Because Martial Artist can just give you those stances with fewer bells and whistles from Monk. And just like different ways to do your unarmed strike type stuff. So, I would highly recommend doing Martial Artist if you're just interested in a stance. However, Monk itself can still give you access to some of those key spells. It can give you access to more hit points. It can give you access to move speed if you're not wearing armor. So if you're something like, I don't know, a wizard that's not going to be wearing much armor anyway... I guess this is a thing you can do. And also rogues, because they're going to be getting up to 20 decks pretty soon, then they won't need armor. So, plus 10 speed bonus is really nice. They get X to Floria Blows, just because why not? And then, you can just pick a saving throw to tick up to Master. And now, a lot of characters do not get all their saving throws to Master. They're, they're like Adventuring Career. So this is a way for you to take the game and say, I am actually master in this thing. So if you are a fighter, this would let you get master will save and cover up one of the big weaknesses of the fighter class. So because of that, Monk definitely gets a shout out. Now I'm going to bring up what I think are the two strongest cast archetypes. Uh, two, there it is, now it's on screen. So they are Bard and Psychic. Now what makes me think Bard is particularly strong is Bard has some pretty strong early feats for a caster, particularly because you can get things like Bardic Lore pretty early on by taking a second level Bard feat and then having that Bard feat then be something along the lines of Multifarious Muse, which then lets you pick another Muse and then you can pick into Enigma so you can multi-class very, very easily into different types of Bard, getting access to a lot of those lower level feats that are very potent. Because as soon as you get Lingering Composition especially, because then you can get stuff like Inspire Courage at level 8. You can get things like Dirge of Doom at level 8. And you can basically have the Bard's like core thing, along with its core thing supporting it, at this level 8 mark, and be able to give these status bonuses to attack rolls very, very easily on any character that just has 14 Charisma. Very, very, very strong thing. And... I think support, very, very powerful. So, that's one thing. And Psychic is if you see support features and you go, <coughs> and you just make a bunch of fart noises at your GM. So, this is for the people that like to see Big Number go burp. Because what Psychic does is it has you pick a conscious mind, which is the, one of their two subclasses they get to pick because advanced classes be this way. <laughs> And it says that you go ahead and pick one of them. So most people pick Oscillating Wave or Tangible Dream. Tangible Dream tends to be the most popular for the Dip Psychics. And the reason is, go in here, they pick Shield or Dancing Lights. And then eventually, they then get to pick the Unique Cantrip, which in this case is Imaginary Weapon and is completely absurd because of its Hidden. Or its Amp, I should say. Because now you're doing 2 gates on two targets with just like the spell text just going 
Yeah, it's range touch only, but like, whatever. Now, normally this is balanced on Psychic because, well, Psychics don't get any meta magic feats, which means they don't get Reach spell. That's not true of a Bard who also has a Cult Scaling, can also use Charisma, and then also has Focus Spells they don't mind pumping into a Psychic thing to just nuke two creatures for a three action activity. Just saying. And there's also a very, very popular dip on things like Magus. Because now suddenly that, like, cleaving spell strike thing has a very, very strong spell to be cleaving with. So, imaginary weapon on the psychic archetype is one of the big things that people dip into this for. And even at this level 1, it gives you an extra focus point, it gives you a cantrip, and if you were to take some, like, oscillating wave, you get a 300-foot range ray of frost. Like, there are so many powerful things you can be doing in the psychic dedication from its unique cantrips that is definitely worth a shout out on this list. Now fans of the channel should not be surprised I left this one for the very end at the number one slot. Anyway, I've already talked about the rest of the archetype at length, like at length length, 30 minute length length, twice. A good percent of my videos are about rest of the archetype, it's a problem, but is it really when you can create as many problems, if not more, for your GM? Because their creatures are not allowed to move. And the reason it's so powerful is it lets any character target a wide variety of saves, which normally only spellcasters are able to do, but now you can do it with martial type numbers. And in my video about wrestler archetype and my class heroes and all that type stuff, I actually go into more detail on how you could use this on different characters. And it's a little too complicated for me to go into here, but if you're somebody that really wants to have utility and crowd control the hell out of every enemy you can see, go play Wrestle Archetype, make your GM miserable, they deserve it somehow, it's their fault, just prove that you're the dominant life form, and that's it.